in the last episode, we are talking about Orientalism and tried to make the point that Orientalism as a body of knowledge or Orientalism in the sense of certain concepts do not really mean anything unless you examine the manner in which these concepts are used. Each of these concepts that Orientalism actually espoused were capable of redeployment with an entirely different meaning. You know how the Orientalist looked upon Indian village as a changeless entity. And that aspect of changelessness was a target of attack from the so-called utilitarians during the 1820s and 30s. James Mill wished to transform this changeless Indian village into a dynamic society. In the early part of the 20th century, when the nationalists found in this concept of changeless, egalitarian, a harmonious village, an ideal society, and that was Gandhi's argument. You have a whole range of nationalist historians who are making the same point. This methodological question needs to be sorted out at the very early part of this discussion in which we are going to concentrate on a period when Orientalism as a policy was discarded by a set of people, ambitious, somewhat arrogant and aggressive officials who followed James Mill and James Mill's mentor Bentham and tried to apply utilitarian principles in India for India's possible transformation into a modern society. It was a part of the modernization project that many of these early 19th century officials, now more confident about their ability to change India. So such people like Bentinck or Macaulay or evangelicals like Charles Grant were visualizing a new West in India. And you are all familiar with the celebrated statement of Macaulay that as a consequence of this process of westernization, English education will have a race Indian in blood, but in otherwise there will be Englishmen, uh, Englishmen in language, in manners, in customs. Now, how does one explain this kind of attitude? Because it is one kind of imperial attitude which was born out of confidence and which was actually looking for a thoroughgoing transformation of Indian society, unlike their predecessors who were more cautious. But James Mill and others, while trying to spell out the contours of this policy, were drawing on the image of an antique land that had already been drawn in the earlier phase by the Orientalist scholars. The only difference was that they were trying to change it. They were not enamored by the idea that this was an ancient civilization and therefore needed to be preserved. They were more in inspired more by the idea of a certain kind of universalism, liberal universalism, which was prodding them to recommend policies which their followers in India were expected to follow, to adopt and to practice. So, sir, are we to look upon this impact of British liberal perception about India as a homogeneous strand of thought or were there differences? Certainly there were differences. Homogeneity never existed in the realm of thought nor in the field of practice. For example, a man like Burke, who was labeled as a conservative because of his reaction against the French Revolution, had a more liberal attitude towards India, more comparable to the kind of position that a man like William Jones was taking. Some kind of regard, some kind of empathy, some kind of respect for the traditional society, for the ancient heritage. And Bark was a great protagonist of the ancient constitution of the land, which he thought needed to be preserved. He never uh, agreed with the proposition 
that there is a duty of the Englishman or duty of Englishmen or Europeans to change the ancient constitution of the land wholesale. Now, was he a liberal? Or, I mean, depending on where you are, you are going to make different assessments. Barque is a conservative as far as French Revolution was concerned. Barque was a liberal as far as Indian historiography is concerned. Indians would look upon Barque as a more liberal person, unlike those liberals of the 1820s and 30s who were recommending wholesale transformation through a process of westernization, westernization of society, westernization of education, introduction of modern reforms, etc. The vision of a westernized Indian society may look arrogant. I mean, it is a sign of the imperial arrogance that you come across in the 1820s and 30s. And it is in this context that you can see the many strands of liberalism. And the relationship between liberalism and imperial practice in India or imperial ideology in India is a more complicated relationship. It actually depends on how you are making use of certain concepts that you have learned as a part of the liberal ideological baggage. And as far as British liberalism was concerned, as you can see very well, the position that Bark was taking was entirely different from what was Mill's position. Mill was inspired by Bentham. Mill was a utilitarian. Mill was a protagonist of a certain kind of liberal universalism in terms of which India was also required to follow the same path that had been traded by the British to create a modern social order, create a modern commercial industrial society. So if that was the kind of projection that Mill had about India in his history of British India where he said that Indians would have to come out of their stupor, would have to forget their history in order to achieve equality with the West, then you have, the, you have, you are certainly, you have a different kind of liberalism which was more aggressive and which has an element of uh, arrogance that was characteristic of imperialism in its more confident. In this liberalism, utilitarianism and evangelical Christianity made their contribution. Charles Glenn thought that Indians were living in the lower scale of civilization and the spread of Christianity would lift them to a higher level. If Grant was thinking of Christianization, others like Macaulay were considering the possibility of westernization through education or through social reform. But besides well, uh, evangelicalism, you have utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, once again, is not one body of thought, you know, it is not just one idea. You have a whole range of ideas actually getting into this corpus of ideology which is called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism also had undergone changes over time. So how did utilitarianism undergo changes in the early part of the 19th century? That is in fact the point that I was trying to strike at. At one level, utilitarianism started from the assumption that man was naturally accumulative, acquisitive. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pleasure and pain. That is the famous pleasure pain arithmetic that Bentham had drawn in one of his earlier texts. The second point was that if you look at utilitarian thought in the late 18th century as it features in Bentham's works or in the works of David Hume. You would come across a certain indifference towards forms of government. For forms of government let fools contend. Whatever governs the best is the best. So the primary responsibility of the lawmakers, the primary responsibility of men in power, men in government was to promote happiness. And happiness, which can be quantified in terms of how much pleasure you are able to derive from accumulation of wealth through pursuit of property or through pursuit of wealth in which you are not going to be constrained by any intervention by the government. 
So you have an element of Luciferism in this kind of an ideology. But what was crucial was that there is no fascination for any particular form of government. If an enlightened despot fulfills all these obligations, then there was no reason for the people to espouse the cause of democracy. As far as education was concerned, one of Bentham's tracts argued that instead of classical education, what was important was to undergo an educational process through which they would be able to acquire the means of livelihood. So it has to be utilitarian. So you should be less uh, interested in classical knowledge. You should be more interested in the knowledge that mattered in matters of livelihood. Thirdly, and that is where I think that the early 19th century change in utilitarianism is important, that after the French Revolution, which actually troubled a man like Bark, who then was talking about the collapse of the ancient constitution in France and condemned it. Bentham also became troubled by the French Revolution. So from the early part of the 19th century, he began to recommend representative government in England in order to avoid the calamity of the French Revolution. You know that during the French Revolution, the radical movements in England. So since the revolution put the scare into their mind, the alternative to the catastrophe of the revolution was enfranchisement of the people. That you create a structure of political democracy, you create a more elaborate system of representative government through which people would be pacified, through which people would be able to channel their grievances instead of going to the path of the revolution. So by 1820s and 1830s, a theory of utilitarian democracy was also emerging. So the kind of indifference that Bentham had himself had shown to forms of government in the earlier time, in the late 18th century, was replaced by a certain attraction for representative government as a barrier against revolution in the first place and as the least harmful government also. So because of their self-interest, they would be controlling the self-interest of the rulers. So balance between the self-interest of the people can be achieved only in a representative government through greater enfranchisement of the people. Initially in 1832, in the first Reform Act in England, the sections of the lower middle classes were enfranchised, but then this policy continued in the 1860s. and the working class also got the franchise, the male working class. The women were enfranchised much later. So this transformation of utilitarianism is important to the degree that this aspect of utilitarianism had no relevance for India. So when you talk about utilitarianism in India, you inevitably discuss the limited impact that utilitarian thought had on India policy. The policy makers in India were making use of utilitarian ideas to some extent, but not only. Because by the time Bentinck was in Calcutta as the Governor General, England was already undergoing this process of a democratic transformation. But the principle that the best government was a representative government had been accepted. John Stuart Mill, son of James Mill, became one of the greatest exponents of representative government. So if you look at the manner in which utilitarianism was making its impact on Indian policy, you can see the limitation very clearly. The very limited meaning that utilitarianism had for India policy. Social reform was undertaking, but once again, not on a grand scale. I mean, you have this example of the suppression of the Thuggy by William Bentinck or under Bentinck's governor generalship, the law against sati, the self-immolation of widows, or more importantly, English education. Macaulay's Minute of 1835 is well known. And there was, of course, an administrative motive behind it. But at the same time, as some of the recent researchers have shown, 
that the kind of education that the that Macaulay and his contemporaries visualized for India was intended to create a feeling of loyalty among Indians towards imperialism. But when it came to the question of introducing political democracy in India, representative government in India, all these utilitarians, despite their recommendation for greater enfranchisement of the people in England, stopped short. They were not in a mood to introduce political democracy or they were not in a mood to introduce representative government in India. They believed that Indian society needed to be changed, needed to be brought out of its stupor, needed to be made dynamic once again. But unless Indians were able to acquire the skill or acquire that high status on the scale of civilization, unless the Indians were able to achieve a certain equality with Englishmen, there was no question of introducing representative government or political democracy in India. Even John Stuart Mill was no exception. Indians were required to live under the guidance of the British. The British who knew how to manage a modern state, who knew how to create a modern society, would actually tutor Indians to better living. And once Indians achieved that position, they would be able to manage the institutions of self-government. They would be entitled to the right of self-government or they would be enfranchised. Uh, so, sir, are we to believe that the liberal experiments of the 1820s and the 30s had a very marginal impact on the British officials such that the gap between East and the West was again emphasized? In the first place, yes, that it had a marginal impact on the official mind. Benting was only ruling in fact, but actually it was James Mill and Bentham were ruling invisibly from behind with their ideas. But at the same time, you must uh, realize that the revolt of 1857 was a very important turning point in the history of imperialism. Because the kind of confidence that the British had about their modernizing project was shattered to a large extent by the experience of the revolt. The revolt actually represented for the British the assertion of Indian conservatism, the Indian inertia, the Indian reluctance to accept change. If you go through many of these analyses of why the revolt happened, at least in British official circles, you come across this sentiment. So after the revolt, the imperial attitudes began to change once again. The kind of aggressive modernization policy that at least theoretically James Mill's vision espoused was discarded in favor of uh, a more cautious policy once again. A, a little bit of circumspection was preferred. And it is in this context that paternalism became more acceptable, became more powerful as an ideology. So how does one explain this, that paternalism became more powerful as an ideology and after the 1857 revolt? Part of the answer I have given that paternalism as an ideology was inherent also in the kind of liberalism that James Mill or John Stuart had espoused. India was to be changed, but changed under British guardianship. But I have said that the main difference was that these guardians were ready to allow the child to grow into an adult at one stage. But the guardians within the paternalist mold would not actually allow the child to grow. They would look upon the Indian society as living in a condition of perpetual childhood. You may also recall that famous poem by Kipling, where he is actually calling upon his countrymen to go to India and serve India, the captive people, the sullen people, and where he uses this expression, this phrase, half devil, half child. So that is the paternalist vision, that you are not going to give Indians the right of self-government. They are incapable of achieving that 
status. They are incapable of achieving this equality with the West. You are going to keep them under order. They were always uh, inspired to some extent by the Victorian adage, spare the rod and spoil the child. So the question of democracy didn't arise. The authoritarian regime must be in its place. And this particular sentiment was articulated in a variety of ways, drawing on the assumption that India was not going to change. India was incapable of becoming a self-governing people. So you can see the difference then clearly from the kind of optimism that the era of reform had actually suggested. Despite the arrogance of the utilitarians, despite the fact that the utilitarians in India were not going to practice utilitarianism wholly, would withhold from experiment in India the principles of representative government, still they had a certain vision about India's eventual transformation into a modern society, something which these conservative paternalists never had. So we are arguing that the use of these concepts or the use of these assumptions on which basis we're trying to figure out orientalism or utilitarianism or liberalism, these concepts ultimately become meaningful when you see them in practice, when you see the changing meanings of these concepts through changing practice of imperialism. So that after 1857, when the imperial rulers felt threatened by the possibility of another mutiny sometime in future, they came away from the mutiny with the conviction that this change-resistant Indian society had reacted against these policies of reform and therefore it was prudent to avoid such things. And you justify this particular policy which is born out of exigencies, which is born out of one's experience of ruling India, in terms of certain concepts that orientalist knowledge had produced in the past relating to changelessness, the concept of changeless India. So at one level, there is no difference between paternalism and the kind of liberalism that Mill had espoused, but there is a difference. Difference in terms of how you are visualizing the future of India. But then, if you come to analyze practice, then you see how all along the line you have many limitations. Even in the heyday of utilitarian experiment in India, you have barriers against the full-scale implementation of utilitarian ideology. Certainly utilitarian officials in India introduced certain land settlements in the northwestern provinces and in Maharashtra where the principle of private property was introduced on the assumption that protection of property for the peasantry would make them, improving peasantry would make them capitalist peasants. So in Maharashtra you have this utilitarian experiment and the basic assumption was that these intermediary groups, these landlords were parasitic classes so it was important to get rid of them and entitle the peasant with right of property. But you come to 1858, 1859, you look at Awadh. In Awadh in 1856, a land settlement was introduced in which these intermediaries were removed on the same presumption. But then after the mutiny, the Talukdas returned. Talukdas were restored to their power. So you have a different practice of imperialism instantly once people realize that the revolt had been caused by the grievances of the Talukdars. So ultimately, you have to look at imperial practice. Whether you are talking about the Orientalist assumptions and their questioning by the liberal imperialists like Mill, ultimately the impact of all these ideas has to be measured in terms of imperial practice. Ultimately, the implications of these ideas would be found in different kinds of practices. You see them as happenings arising from 
one's experience of ruling India. So, as we try to sum up this part of the discussion, you have utilitarian experiments in land revenue in certain regions. You have this ambitious program of westernization of education associated with Macaulay. You have certain interventions in Indian social custom, abolition of barbaric practices like sati. But behind all this, you have this particular vision of making India modern. But as you come away from 1840s and enter the 1850s and 1860s, this optimism begins to dissipate. So imperial practice needs to be assessed in terms of the exigencies and among these exigencies figure prominently the kind of pressures that Indian society was bearing upon imperialism. So this is the problem that one has to attack. When you talk about Orientalism, when you talk about utilitarianism, when you talk about laissez-faireism and its impact on British practice, on British policy, you have to remember that ideas alone didn't influence policy making. It is a constant exchange between experience and ideas. The utilitarians practiced utilitarianism only within limitations created by imperial practice in India. So paternalism, orientalism, utilitarianism, laissez-faireism, all these ideas which apparently had governed policy making in India required to be studied in terms of the changing practice of imperialism in India. And this will become clearer when we talk about imperial practice in the later half of the 19th century with reference to laissez-faire. 